by God's grace and for His glory. This is Woodmont Baptist Church. Amen. Thank you, Nate. Majestic, uh, glorious welcome. Thank you for the prelude leading us to the throne this morning. Thank you for being here today. I'm Nathan Parker. I get to be the pastor at Woodmont Baptist Church. Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Whatever you're going through today, let me just say that for those who are weary and need rest, for those who mourn and long for comfort, for those who fail and desire strength, for those who sin and need a savior, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ, the friend of sinners. Amen? Amen. Thank God that he welcomes us into his presence. Where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is with us. What an amazing promise. If that's true, if God is here, then nothing else matters. Isn't that amazing? If God's spirit is with us, that's all that matters in this moment. And if we encounter him in an honest way, we will leave this place changed forever. That's the promise from scripture. If you're visiting with us today, we got all the Perkins family back there from Ohio. Welcome to you guys. What a great week for Gabe, our graduate. Uh, we're so proud of, of Gabe and all that he's done uh, here over the years. It was cool to see uh, former youth come to his party last night and celebrate him and a lot of church people there. What a wonderful time of fellowship we had at Eddie Fest yesterday too. Uh, yeah, a hundred and, what was it, 120, how many? 123 people showed up. Thank you, Ron, and everyone else, Haley, and everyone who helped uh, prepare for Eddie Fest. What a great time of fellowship and being around the table. If you missed it, you're all invited next year, okay? It's going to be a wonderful time. Uh, I invite you to, to fill out the connection card uh, online, woodmontbaptist.com, or fill it out with an actual ink pen, old school, uh, or pencil, and drop it uh, in one of the connection boxes on the way out, or hand it to me, or whatever. Uh, there's lots of ways to give. Thank you for your faithful giving. I'm, I'm so blessed to be a part of a church that's so generous. Last week we announced that we gave $33,000, almost $34,000 for Ukraine relief in Poland and, and other places in Europe. Just amazing work that God's doing through this church. Dr. Ayler is with us again today. Hey, how are you? <laughs> We're so blessed to have you again. DMA, is that doctor of... Musical arts, excellent. Uh, Jim helped us during our transition time a couple of years ago, and Aaron uh, Duncan is cold in Tulsa. Is it, why is it so cold in Tulsa? He's at the PGA Championship. They're all in like coats, and I don't think Aaron was prepared for how cold it is there, but he's enjoying some golf uh, with his family in Tulsa. Uh, this is our last midweek service. This, uh, the 25th will be our last. Please register online for meals. It really helps Lynn and her team out if you're going to come for the final. How many people did you feed last week? 60? Is that right? 60. Lynn and her team fed 60 people at midweek. It was awesome. Last week, uh, Discover Woodmont class. If you want to know more about our church, and it's not a commitment, it's not a requirement either, but if you want to come for a free lunch that Lynn and her team are catering on June 12th, please go to the website, woodmontbaptist.com, and register for that lunch. Our staff will be there to tell you about who Woodmont is and how we function as a church and what our vision is for the future. Then on Wednesday, we're gonna play kickball again, June 15th. I think last time we may have had some church members who aren't speaking to each other still because of the last tournament, so we're gonna hope to squash that and uh, we're gonna see what happens this year. But uh, sign up online, get a team together, it's a great time. You don't have to play kickball to come. Uh, Chick-fil-A sandwiches are available. Uh, Chick-fil-A meal for $5 if you want a, a Chick-fil-A meal. Uh, sign up online for that. It's gonna be a great time of fellowship and just hanging out as a church. We really believe that God wants us to get to know one another and get to enjoy spending time together. And that's what this is all about. And today we gather in this place to lift high the name of the Lord. So let's do that as we continue to worship him together. 
Well, I thought it would be appropriate to read a psalm before we sing our first hymn. So I'm going to read all of Psalm number 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people of the earth. For he loves us with unfailing love. The faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. That was 117. You know, I told my granddaughter that if she wanted to impress her Sunday school teacher, she should tell her, I've learned a whole, I've memorized a whole book of the Bible. And I told her, you ought to memorize 117. It's just two verses, but it would be a whole book of the Bible. So anyway, let me read this again. You ready? Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people of the earth. For he loves us with his unfailing love. His faithfulness, the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's stand and sing hymn number 488. Come all Christians be committed. Be seated. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim, choir, uh, companies. Uh, as you know, on the, 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 each month we like to highlight uh, a mission partner from Woodmont Baptist Church. And uh, this, this month we're going to highlight our own Swahili Baptist Church that meets here in our building. So, Pastor Ezekiel and Janine Cobway, please come on up and uh, have a seat here. We're going to have a, a conversation just about. Uh, who Pastor Ezekiel is and the Swahili Baptist Church. You take that. Hey, Janine, have a seat, and uh, we'll just have a, a brief conversation here. 
as, as you know, the Swahili Baptist Church has been meeting here uh, at Woodmont Baptist for over almost 11 years now since Pastor Mimba and Carlos Owens, who is a career IMB missionary, got together and figured out how to make this uh, church work. And we have hosted them here. And uh, these are mostly refugees, right? Refugees from uh, Tanzania and from Congo and uh, Uganda even, uh, we heard. Uh, it's amazing how God has led them here. And uh, we want to support them and pray for them. And I want you to get to know their new pastor, Pastor Ezekiel. He was called by the Swahili Baptist Church in 2020. And a lot of you don't know him. So I wanted you to get to know him and his family. Uh, pastor Ezekiel, tell us about yourself. Where are you from and, and, and who's your family? Um, anataka uambie wewe ni nani na umetoka wapi na kuhusu familia yako vile vile. Ninawasalimu katika jina la Yesu Kristo. I greet you all in the name of Jesus. Ninaitwa kwa jina la Pastor Ezekiel Batende. My name is Ezekiel Batende. Mimi nimetoka katika nchi ya Kongo. I am from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Na kabla nitoke Kongo kwa ajili ya vita nikaingia mpaka Uganda. And because of the genocide in Congo, I, I escaped and went to Uganda. Na pale Uganda nimefanya miaka kumina moja ndani ya camp pale. And I spent 11 years in the camp of Uganda. Some people may not know the genocide in Uganda. This is a civil war, right? In 2007, 2008, somewhere in there. Anauliza vita vya ambavu likimbia kutoka Congo vilikuwa vya mwaka gani ndo vile vita ambavu vimesababisha watu wengi wa mekimbia. Okay, hiyo vita ilikuwa ya mwaka elfu mbili na nani. Yeah, from 2008. 2008. Mm. Wow. So you went to Uganda to a refugee camp. Kwa hiyo ulikwenda katika kambi pale Uganda? Nikaika pale Uganda, tukaingia pale kwa kambi. Yes. Na hapo tukafanikiwa, Mungu aliniwezesha nikaingia pale na familia yangu. And through the immigration, uh, the God uh, uh, gave us a favor to escape and come with my I have my whole family here. Mimi ni baba wa mke mmoja. I have one wife. Na nimebarikiwa na watoto nane. And I have been blessed with eight children. Kavira, raise your hand, Kavira. Yeah. Raise your hand. Yeah. There she is, Kavira. Uyo ndiyo mke wangu. That is my wife. Na kati ya watoto ambao nimeza. And in all the children that I have given birth to. Nina watoto wane wa vijana. I have four guys. Na watoto wane wa binti. And four girls. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Eight kids. Yeah. Wakati nimekuwa hapo Uganda sasa. And while I was in Uganda. Ijapokuwa maisha ya ya ukimbizi ilikuwa nguvu. Although we struggle because of refugee life. Lakini Mungu alituwezesha tukaikaa ndani ya Mungu, tukafanya kazi ya Mungu hapo kwa hiyo miaka yote tulikuwa hapo. But God gave us the strength and we continue to serve him while we were in the camp. 11 years. 11 yes. years yes. In, yes. Refugee camp in Uganda. We can't we can't fathom most of us what that would look like. Ah ya hiyo inaonekana kwamba ni wakati mgumu kufanya miaka 11 katika kambi. Na wakati tulifanya hiyo miaka 11 kwenye camp and while we were there for 11 years, Mungu wa mbinguni akafanya mjiza. And God did miracles. Na wakati alifanya mjiza, and when he did miracles, nikasikia wananiambia kwamba Pastor Ezekiel unaenda Marekani. I was told by the immigration that I'll be coming to US. Bwana Yesu asifiwe. Praise the Lord. Na wakati nimefika hapa mbele nifike Marekani kijana wangu wa kwanza ombeni ndio ambaye alitangulia hapa Marekani. Uh, but before I came, my first son came before me. Na wakati ye alifika hapa, aka ingia kwenye kanisa la Swahili Batisi Church hapa at Woodmont. And once he got here, he started worshiping here at the Swahili Woodmont Baptist Church. Na mimi pia wakati mungu aminitendea mema kusudi nifike hapa marekani. And when God brought us here, Nimefika hapa mwaka elfu, elfu mbili na kuminatisa. I got here in 2019. Na wakati nimefika hapa marekani. And when we got here. Nimekaribishwa ndani ya kanisa la Swahili Baptist at Woodmont. I was welcomed by the church of the Swahili Baptist Woodmont. Nilikutana pastor member hapa. And I met pastor member here. Na wakati nimemukutana hapa. And when I met him. Hakufanya miaka mingi, hakufanya tena siku nyingi kusudi ya aende. Uh, he didn't live here for long after he went back to uh, Africa. Basi na tangu yosiku imekaribishwa kwenye kanisa la Swahili 
Batiste Etehudu Monte na hapo nimeikaa na na mimi ninafanya kazi hapa kwenye kanisa la Swahili. And eh, since but, then I was welcomed by the Swahili Baptist Church and I've been serving God uh, from there. Na nimeanza kazi tangu mwaka 2020. And I started serving uh, since 2020. Amen. Amen. Well, we want to pray for your church and we want to uh, we we want to partner with your church in ministry and in mission and you teach us and and we teach you and it's a, a, a wonderful partnership in the gospel. How can we pray for your church? Anataka tufanye ushirika pamoja na kanisa lenu na tunapenda kuwa tunashirikiana nanyi kwa mambo mbalimbali lakini pia anataka tuwasaidie katika maombi ikiwa kama mtakuwa anahitaji lolote katika kanisa ambalo mnataka tuwasaidieni kuomba basi utujulishe ili kwamba tuombe hilo Ndiyo kabisa unajua katika kazi ya Mungu mahitaji hayawezi kosa As you all know in, in serving the Lord of course we have our needs that we have to present before the Lord Kitu cha kwanza ambacho tutahitaji mtusaidie kwa maombi The first thing that we need your help prayer with ni kuombea kanisa letu la Swahili Baptist Church kusudi kitu cha kwanza tuwe na umoja The first thing is to pray about the whole Swahili Baptist Church so that we can be united Kitu cha pili and second thing Mungu atuwezeshe ili wakati tunapofanya huduma tuifanye kwa kweli tuifanye kwa roho na kusudi kazi ya Mungu ipate utukufu kwa bwana And the second thing is for God to give us the ability to continue serving him in his righteousness Ni hiyo mahitaji mm. ambayo and that's the prayers that we'll Amen. be needing. Mm. Well, let's pray right now for the Swahili Baptist Church, and then I'm going to ask you, Pastor Ezekiel, to pray for Woodmont Baptist Church in Swahili, and you don't need to translate it, but the Lord hears and the Lord understands. So let's go to the Lord now in a word of prayer for our Swahili brothers and sisters. Basi tutakwenda kuomba, na baada ya maombi, pastor, utakwenda kuomba kwa jili ya kanisa hili kwa kiswahili. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for bringing Pastor Ezekiel here. We thank you for bringing Pastor, Pastor Mimba here and for Carlos and Murtis Owens who helped establish this new work, this new congregation here uh, through Woodmont Baptist Church. Lord, we thank you for the partnership that we have in the gospel with our brothers and sisters who come from uh, Africa. God, you, you brought them here for a reason and for a purpose, so I pray that they would continue to live into that purpose be with Pastor Ezekiel as he guides this church in the way that they should go. As he requested, Lord, we pray that you would grant the entire church unity and strength to serve you in your righteousness, in your holiness. Help them to uh, be preserved and protected for healthy ministry and gospel witness here in Nashville and beyond. We thank you for the work in Baraka that they continue to support in Congo. God, we thank you for Nick and Connie Bushy who have given so generously of their time and talent and treasure to serve as, as our liaisons with the Swahili Baptist Church. And God, we pray that you would continue to, to move the Swahili Baptist Church into the way that you would have them to go. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Mungu Baba, katika jina la Yesu Christo, nina simama mbele zako, ili nipate ku endelea kunyosha mkono na kupaza hii sauti kwa ajili ya kanisa lako hapa kwa Woodmont. Ninaomba kwa ajili ya kanisa lako ye Mungu uliwezeshe zaidi naombea watumishi. Ninaombea mpendwa Nathan hapa ili wakati anaposimama pamoja na watumishi wengine wote kwa kuendelea kuongoza kazi yako sio rahisi lakini najua kwamba kupitia nguvu ambazo utaendelea kumpatia kumpitia hiyo roho mtakatifu ambayo atasimama nayo aonekane kuongoza kanisa baba ninajua kwamba kanisa ni lako na watu ni wako ndio maana inabidi e mungu we mwenyewe bwana wanapofanya kazi waifanye kwa umoja waifanye kwa roho na zaidi tunapofanya kazi tuifanye sisi sote kwa ushirika na kwa umoja ili siku moja tupate kabisa kukuona sawa jinsi ulivyo asante mungu kwa maana ni wewe yule ambao utatenda na kuendelea kusaidia wapendwa wote mahali hapa wa baba kama vile wa mama ili kanisa lako lionekane kupata nguvu ninajua kwamba kupitia nguvu zako na kupitia roho mtakatifu kupitia kazi utakayofanya siku moja ndio utakapofika kuchukua kanisa lako tuwe tayari sote kwa kukulaki mawingoni tunaomba tukishukuru ni kupitia jina la Yesu Kristo amen amen thank you so much thank you for being with us let's give uh, Ezekiel and Janina a hand thank you Blessings, thank you. Blessings.
They have to get to their church. Yeah, so they're going to their service. So thank you for being with us. Well, I love this next hymn. Uh, it says, Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Amen. Praise the Lord. Jesus, lover of my soul, even me. Friends may fail me, and they have. Foes assail me, and they have. He, my Savior, makes me whole. So every phrase of this hymn, I think I could go, amen. Yeah, that's the truth. Yes, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. So as we sing... Uh, think, uh, sing this hymn prayerfully, if you would, please. It's number 422, if you're following along in the hymnal. Let's stand and sing.
Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> so uh, our pastor this morning, <laughs> I, I read through the scripture and thought, whoa, good luck on this one. And uh, so one of the things Paul's talking about in this passage is, you know, circumcision versus uncircumcision. And he's talking about slave versus free. And, you know, Paul also talked about male versus female and Jewish uh, uh, versus Gentile. And, but in this passage, Paul says, you know what? None of that matters. He says, keeping God's commandments is what counts. That's what he said. And then a little later on in the passage, Paul reminds us, you were bought with a price. And that price is the blood of Christ. You know, the blood of Christ is sufficient to save everybody, but it's efficient to save us individually, those who are, accept the grace of God, who accept what the blood of Christ has done for us. And this next hymn speaks clearly to that, and, you know, today could be the day of salvation for you if you don't know the Lord. But, again, His blood is sufficient for all. It's efficient only if we receive what He has given to us. Let's sing this hymn together. It's number 510, Lord, Here Am I. Let's stand and sing. lead us in prayer. We'll remain standing for the prayer. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, 
ready and willing, here we are, help us to give us the ability and the wisdom to do your kingdom work. Help us, thank you for the staff and the lay leaders at this church who are guiding us. Thank you for this transition into the end of school and through summer and help us this summer to be a time of rejuvenation and thank you for the, the rain and the beauty and the flowers that that, that provides. Thank you for Pastor Ezekiel and the testimony of the Swahili Baptist Church. Help Woodmont to be a partner that can help the, the, the Swahili Baptist Church grow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, choir, and Dr. Ayler, accompanist. That's a Jim Ayler original piece. You don't hear a lot of bad, yeah, awesome. I came into choir on Wednesday night and I, I said, who wrote this? And I, I, I knew who wrote it, but I, I threw open the, the book and I said, who, who in the world wrote this? And Jim was like, oh no, and I said, I, yeah, it's Jim, I knew that. It was awesome. You don't hear a lot of Baptist pieces about the Holy Spirit, about uh, being spirit-filled. Uh, Laura, one of our new members, comes from a, a kind of a charismatic Assembly of God church, and she said, now I kind of like to raise my hands a little. And I was like, we need some more of that. We need some more spirit-filled uh, worship. So without the Holy Spirit, we're wasting our time. So thank you, uh, Jim, for, for leading us so well and for creating such beautiful pieces. This town is full of musical talent. It's amazing to me. And what's really amazing is that not only is it so talented, but you have such humble, uh, genuine Christian musicians who really aren't in it for their own glory, but are genuinely like Aaron Duncan, like Jim Ayler, like Aaron Legrone, our Wednesday night uh, midweek leader. Uh, they're just such humble servants of the Lord. They're not doing this for money. Uh, they're doing it because they love the Lord and because they uh, love using their musical gifts to further the kingdom. So thank you again, Jim, for being here today. It is another challenging text. You know, when I decided to preach through 1 Corinthians, I knew some things about 1 Corinthians already, and I knew that it was a church that had some issues, and I thought it'd be a really relevant book to preach to Woodmont and as we become healthier as a church together. I knew that it addressed a lot of these uh, issues that churches had. It also fit nicely between Galatians, which we started in January, and Philippians, which we're gonna get to uh, this fall. Eventually, I promise we will get to Philippians. But I didn't think about specific passages within 1 Corinthians that would be extremely difficult for any preacher to preach on a Sunday morning while children are present and that sort of thing. So this morning we have another challenging text. But here's the thing, okay? 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God, that the person of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I love how the New Living Translation puts it, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Therefore, we should consume a steady diet of God's word in its entirety. We should have all kinds of scripture. We should have Old Testament, New Testament. We should have books of history. We should have the New Testament letters. We should have prophecy. We should have gospel readings, wisdom literature, all of those things. In Acts 20, uh, verse 27, the Apostle Paul meets with the, the elders, the pastors of the church in Ephesus, and he tells them, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel. I didn't avoid the tricky bits, is what he's saying. And when you preach expositionally through a book of the Bible, you can't help but deal with the tricky bits. So today, we're going to be confronted with what Al Gore may refer to as some inconvenient truths of the Bible, but they are truths nonetheless. And God's word often has a way of, of breaking down our preconceived ideas of what is right and what we think is true and good, and then building back up a new and, and better understanding of reality. We all have our ideas of how we think life should be or how life ought to go for us. We all have a vision of what we believe the good life is, what we think the good life is all about. But life seldom, if ever, in my experience, I don't know about you, but it rarely works out the way I think it should. My plans and my vision for what I think life should be rarely comes to fruition. Why is that? Because God is sovereign and we are not. 
You don't see something coming like open heart surgery, right, John? You don't see something coming like a, a big move out to the country, right, Braden and Emmy? You don't see things coming like that, but they, they come, and God's in charge, and we realize in those moments we are definitely not. And some preachers would tell you that if you really believe in God and if you really are doing the right things and paying your tithes especially, then your vision of the good life will come true. But that's nowhere in Scripture. In our, in our current uh, culture of expressive individualism where everyone's trained to live out their own desires against society, this may sound appealing to be able to control your, your destiny, to be able to fulfill your own expectations for how you think life should go. I'm seeing this everywhere now. Just this past week, uh, May, our fourth grader had a school uh, choir concert and uh, Camila was there and uh, others that uh, joined in the choir and they sang a song from uh, Disney's high school musical. You uh, older uh, Gen Z or younger millennials will, will know these words from we're all in this together. Here and now, it's time for celebration. I finally figured it out that all our dreams have no, what Michaela, you probably know, have no limitations. Have no, all our dreams have no limitations. That's what it's all about. We make our dreams come true. We're teaching our children this before they're even old enough to realize that your dreams probably aren't going to come true. That's the reality. Jesus told us in this world you will have tribulation. But that's not what is really taught in, in our culture. But isn't it more honest, isn't it more authentic to ask what happens when your dreams don't come true? What we're gonna see in our text for today is some practical wisdom for how to flourish in whatever situation we find ourselves. Being, uh, you know, fleeing a war-torn country like um, Pastor Ezekiel did or like the Yarbros did over here from the Ukraine. That's a situation that they didn't see themselves in. I was talking to a Ukrainian mother from our weekday preschool, Yulia. She goes by Julia now, and she had a friend with her at the, the graduation ceremony, and her friend had just gotten over here from Poland. Uh, she was a, from Ukraine, but she had been in Poland for two months trying to get a visa to come to America. She said the conditions in Poland were terrible. And her 13-year-old son is with her, and he's attending school online when his teacher is not under an air raid from 1 a.m. to 7 a.m. every day online as he tries to finish seventh grade in Ukraine. And she said to me, three months ago, everything was normal. No one could have predicted what's going on right now in Ukraine. We never thought something could happen like this. What do you do? when you find yourself in a situation that you never could have seen coming. I'm, I'm gonna suggest that you seek God's best for whatever context you may find yourself in. So our outline for today is a little tongue in cheek, Joel Osteen, maybe, uh, you know, not find this funny, but your best life now, the life that God has assigned. Your best life now isn't one that you create through your obedience to God or how much money you give to the church, your best life now is the one that God has assigned to you. It's kind of like that old adage, it's not in the Bible, but it's, I think, biblical in its nature. Bloom where you are, what? Planted. Bloom where you are planted. That implies that you're not the one who planted yourself, but a higher power a sovereign being who you are not planted you there, bloom where you are planted. What we're gonna see in, in 1 Corinthians chapter seven is that the best life that we can possibly live is the one which God has picked out for us and gifted us with no matter where it may take us. For some, it, it may mean blooming in the context of marriage in the context of the most important earthly relationship that you may have, the one with your spouse. Point one on your outline is, is God's best 
for married couples. In the first seven verses, we're going to see God's best. This whole month, we're talking about living into God's best because God's ways, as instructed in Scripture, are always best. And we have these competing voices in the world that say, no, 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 make your own dreams come true. That's best. And then we have Scripture saying, no, bloom where you're planted. That's actually best. And God's ways actually lead to flourishing. The Corinthian Christians were very confused, okay, about a lot of things, and one of those things was marriage and divorce. They didn't understand it. So they, they wrote to Paul a letter. We don't have that letter, but he was their spiritual father. He had planted the church there. He had discipled them. He had baptized many of them. And they asked him these questions, but the, the funny, not funny, it's terrible. The first six chapters of 1 Corinthians he says, yeah, 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 I got your letter. I'm going to deal with that in a minute. But first, I've heard that there's a lot of terrible things happening in your church. There's blatant sexual sin. There is rampant divisions over which preacher is more popular and who baptized who. There are social divisions. You, you guys are, are, are messed up on so many things. So the first six chapters, he basically says, cut it out. Stop doing these terrible things. And then finally here in chapter 7, he says this, starting in verse 1. Now, whew, he's like, now, lecture over. Concerning the matters about which you wrote, it's good for a man, this is a quote from their letter, it's good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights. That was very progressive in these ancient days. That sounds like something you'd hear today out of a feminist camp, but it's in the Bible. And likewise, the wife to her husband. A lot of Christians who understand that we are spiritual beings have a tendency to disconnect our bodies from our faith. They believe either, you know, one of two things. One is that what we do with our bodies doesn't really matter now because we're spiritual beings, so we can do whatever we want. Or the other thing is that we should be very uh, ascetic and we should be disciplined like a hermit and just avoid any kind of physical pleasure. Paul says both these things are wrong, okay? We live in an embodied faith. God took on flesh right? We live as holistic beings, mind, body, and soul. And each aspect deeply affects the other two. When your physical health is out of whack, it, 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 it messes up your spiritual and mental health. When your mental health is out of whack, your spiritual and physical health. We are holistic creatures. I should have had you preach, Daniel. You're like marriage therapist. You should have done this whole lesson. These, these guys are like, marriage uh, experts and counselors. Uh, I, I'm not that. Uh, but we are holistic beings, and when one part's out of whack, the other parts are too. The Corinthian church apparently thought that no Christian should ever engage in, in physical intimacy of any kind. But Paul says, no, 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 no. There's a moral place for it in the context of Christian marriage. And again, Paul's way ahead of his time. I know, like, when we get to chapter 11, I've already had a church member tell me, I don't like that chapter 11 where he says women should be quiet. I was like, I know, I know, we'll deal with that when we get to it. But Paul seems, you know, misogynistic. He, he gets billed as chauvinistic. I, I get it. But look at verses 4 and 5. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Okay, that's the sermon. Let's go. Is that, no, wait, wait. There's more. There's more. Keep reading. The husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. What? That's, that's, that's crazy talk, Paul. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. The Christian life, okay, the gospel-centered life, is about learning how to die to yourself and how to live for God and for others more fully. That's the best way to live, cheerfully giving ourselves away, pouring out our lives for the sake of God and for others. It's the only way to live. 
It's how the gospel of Jesus enables and compels us to live. And there's this beautiful mutual submission. Everybody reads from like Ephesians 5, 22, you know, wives, submit to your husbands at a wedding, but they don't always read verse 21 that says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. There's this beautiful deference, right? A, a mutual kind of submission that Christians, they don't fear being walked on. They don't fear being a doormat because they believe that God has actually empowered them and that in our weakness, we are made strong by his perfect provision. I, I do think that there's, we can get into more of this later. This is tricky ground here, but, but I love how open Paul is. He's very flexible in all this. This is kind of gray area stuff that, that Paul's kind of dealing with here. He, he, he is gracious in his uh, rules. Verse six, he says, I, I say this as a concession, not as a command. He's, he's not imposing temporary abstinence in a marriage, but he's allowing for it. It's like him quoting the Corinthians in chapter six, where they said, all things are permissible. We're under grace now, we can do whatever we want. He says, yeah, that's true, but not all things are helpful. Not all things are beneficial, I think the NIV says. He's very flexible in this. What is God's best? What is gonna lead ultimately to flourishing? Paul himself was single. Okay, look at how he frames marriage and singleness in verse seven. I wish that all were as I myself am. That would be a lot less complicated. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. We don't know why Paul was single. Maybe his wife left him after his conversion to Christianity. Maybe she died, or, or maybe he never married because Paul was so busy either persecuting Christians or later planting churches and advancing the gospel across the world. Whatever the case, he says here in verse seven, both marriage and singleness have advantages that should be considered as gifts from the Lord, that God has gifted you according to your station in life. Sometimes we say that the Bible, I've said this before, the Bible says it's better to be single than married. It doesn't really say that. Paul's not elevating one over the other, okay? He, he's saying to bloom where you are planted, to be grateful for whatever your station in life. Now, we need to point out here that the church and the culture usually get this wrong, that usually they incorrectly treat marriage as the ideal. Yes, marriage is the norm in this society. That's why he says a man should you know, have his wife, a wife should have her husband. That's the norm, but it's not, it's not the ideal. A local Anglican teacher, Peter Valk, he, he came here and spoke to our staff. He wrote a blog I read recently about what he calls romance idolatry. He says romance is, quote, an emotional desire for sensual love with another person and the courtship behaviors undertaken by an individual to express those feelings on a trajectory of erotic love. And he says that romance idolatry takes root long before the age that a person can marry. Disney movies and Taylor Swift songs teach our children that magically coupled love is the best thing the world has to offer. Single adults, that is not true. That is an idol that we often make of romantic love. And I think the church is complicit in this too, guys. It's not just Disney. We love to rail against Disney. <laughs> the church is, has messed up too. Please do not say to our, I know you're well-meaning. I know you are. But don't say to our single adults, why hasn't anybody snatched you up yet? Just stop saying that, please. Don't, don't say, oh, you're, you're, you're so attractive. Why has no one picked you up yet? Don't, that's not helpful. It's not the ideal. Let's, let, don't ask them, when are you gonna get married? Perhaps the Lord has given them the gift of singleness, at least for a season. Volk, Peter Volk says the idol of romance isn't just a lovey-dovey feeling, it's a, it's a lie from the pit of hell. It promises us love, belonging, family, pleasure, and an escape from loneliness. 
Only Jesus can provide those things in their entirety. Marriage cannot do it. It, uh, No amount of romance can do it either. We need to affirm singleness as not only a valid Christian lifestyle, but as one with distinct advantages. And we need to love one another in such a way that we are family. And this church is really good about it, but we still have room to go. And that we embrace our single adults as part of our family, that we have intimate relationships where we know each other well. I'm so grateful for the singles who've poured into my little family over the years, from helping Jude with his golf swing to to bringing their pets over to our house to doing arts and crafts with May. They're like beloved aunts and uncles to my family. Next, Paul gives a general word to all of us here. God's best for all of us is, is simply faithfulness. That's point number two on your outline. God's best for all of us is faithfulness. Verse eight, he says, to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it's good for them to remain single. Stay faithful in your singleness. Verse 9, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Paul's not saying it's bad to marry or to remarry. I mean, it's good to be single, he says. It's good to, you know, get a PhD, but you're not a second-class citizen if you don't. That's what he's saying here. It's good to be an ordained minister, but you're not a second-class citizen if you're not. What Paul's saying is that when the desire between two people is so strong that it distracts them from the centrality of the gospel in their lives, then yeah, go ahead and get married. And then Paul speaks to married couples again in in, in verse 10. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. Be faithful in your marriage, is what he's saying. Look, we know that marriage is hard. Giving yourself to another person is not easy. Morgan and I have been to marriage counseling often and we're not ashamed of it and we're not shy about telling people that. We all need help. Uh, One of our staff members was saying, I'm gonna put marriage counseling on my wedding registry when I get married because it's so helpful to have it, right? We all need help and a third party expert is a welcome blessing in my marriage for sure. Uh, Christian marriage is a sacred thing. It should be taken seriously. The vows that we make are sacred on our weddings. You know, Catholics, they call it a sacrament. Marriage itself is a holy and sacred means of grace. I'm not gonna go that far, but it is sacred. What happens in a Christian marriage is a divine miracle. Two individuals becoming united as one. That's why Jesus tells us in Matthew 19, Uh, Verse 6, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. We live in an anti-commitment age. A church member was telling me just this week about a man who walked away from his marriage after his wife gave birth to a beautiful baby boy with Down syndrome. That's not that's not just sinful, that's that's destructive evil. We know that Satan is trying to destroy families, and and marriage is is one of the core components of families. He would love to ruin your marriage if you're married here today. In in this anti-commitment age, it's it's easy, legally, to, to get a divorce. Divorce was an easy arrangement with the Roman government in the age of the Corinthian church as well. The word used for divorce here means to send away. And a lot of Corinthian men, we know from history, would just send their wife away for all kinds of superficial reasons. Women were married and married and married and married to many different husbands in this age because Roman law made it so easy. But Christian marriage should only be dissolved for the most severe reasons. Sexual immorality, abuse, or something equally egregious. And no one should stay in an unsafe marriage, okay? I I want that to be clear. But neither should marriage be treated lightly in those marriage vows. If you need help with your marriage, I'd love to talk with you about it. I have a a drawer full of cards 
of licensed marriage and family therapists that I could refer you to who know more than I do. Talk to Daniel and, and Tetiana. They do marriage uh, workshops all the time. They could help you as well. We have resources here, guys. No one needs to walk this alone. Next, Paul shows us God's best for Christians who are married to unbelievers, what, what a lot of commentaries refer to as a mixed marriage. Point number three on your outline. Verse 12 says, to the rest I say, I, not the Lord, he's saying this is just kind of like Paul's opinion here, that if any brother has a wife who's an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. And if any woman has a husband who's an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. That doesn't mean that he's saved, it means that he's conformed to the image of God through his believing wife. And the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they're holy. If the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. For in such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved, God has called you to peace. Isn't Paul gracious and open here? I love it. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? A Christian is their unbelieving spouse's best hope for salvation, right? Uh, it's the best hope of coming to know the Lord and living into God's ways. You know, their children and their spouse may not be saved, but at least they're gonna be more like God because they will be conformed through their witness of the spouse. And here's the key part of this whole text, verse 17. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him or her and to which God has called him or her. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. I looked that one up, it's a real thing. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For as Jim said earlier, neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Did you hear Pastor Ezekiel's request? That they would minister in the righteousness of God. He wants to, to maintain a holiness, a standard of keeping God's commandments. He takes it seriously, and so should we. Verse 20, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bond servant when called? That's like an indentured servant, like a slave almost. Don't be concerned about it. But if you gain your freedom, if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bond servant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bond servant of Christ. You were bought with a price. That's the gospel. Do not become bond servants of men. So brothers and sisters, whatever condition each was called, let him remain there with God. I know the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. The great resignation pastors are, are not different than anybody else. We're like, oh, it'd be nice to go over there and, and do that certain thing, right? We've all uh, wrestled with FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. As a seven on the Enneagram, I'm always uh, scared I'm missing out on something, that there's better circumstances somewhere that I'm missing out on. Other people are stuck in the, the glory days, the good old days, like Uncle Rico and Napoleon Dynamite. Oh, if coach had only put me in, we'd have won state, right? That's, that's kind of where a lot of people live. And, and Satan would love to keep us there, to have us wallow in self-pity and second guess all of our choices, past, present, and future. But God tells us our social status doesn't matter. The size of our bank account doesn't matter. Where we're from doesn't matter. Verse 19 says all that matters is keeping the commandments of God. Living into God's ways wherever we may find ourselves is how we bloom where we are planted. Living into the ways of God is how we live our best life now. Our lives are not our own, so living for ourselves makes no sense. It's a dead end. Living by God's grace and for his glory is how we flourish as human beings made in his image and bought with his blood. Let's close with a word about God's best for singles. The, the ESV uh, translate the word for singles here as betrothed, but it probably refers to young people who are of marrying age. Maybe they're engaged or not, it's not clear. 
Start in verse 25. Concerning the betrothed, the young people of Marian age, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. He's so nuanced and, and open-minded here. He's not harsh. Paul simply wants us to take the long view, to understand the temporary nature of any earthly commitments. Look at verse 21. If you do marry, you've not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she's not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers and sisters. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as, those they, as, as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. O oh Lord, stamp eternity on my eyeballs, as Jonathan Edwards prayed. The Christian life isn't meant to be a burden either. When we take the long view, we live in freedom. Look at verse 32. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife and his interests are divided. Isn't it interesting, he assumes, husbands, that you are anxious about pleasing your wife. I hope that's the case. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit, but the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to what really matters, to the Lord. All right, so what do we do with all this? Let me just give you a few takeaways. First, deference is a mark of the cross-shaped life. Deference, deferring to the other for the sake of the gospel. Man, you see people in traffic all the time, vying for position, cutting off people, getting first. As a Christian, you say, go ahead, man. <laughs> I got all the time in the world. <laughs> I got eternity on my mind. We enjoy submitting to others out of a reverence for Christ. Christian marriage is therefore marked by an intentional, mutual, sacrificial posture toward the other. Christian singleness is marked by an intentional, mutual, sacrificial posture to the other as well. Second, marriage can never take the place of Jesus. So many marriages fail because one spouse, usually a Christian spouse, wants the other to be what only Jesus can be. But no one can replace Jesus. In his book, The Meaning of Marriage, Tim Keller says, without a deeply fulfilling love relationship with Christ now and hope in a perfect love relationship with him in the future, people will put too much pressure on marriage to fulfill them. Third, marriage, singleness, and divorce are not one-size-fits-all kinds of issues. Paul is gracious here. We need to show grace as well. We need to be prayerful in our discernment in how we consider real-life examples. There are people who carry all kinds of baggage from broken marriages, and we need to be sensitive to that. And there is grace, and there is redemption from those wounds, I promise you. But I pray that Woodmont would be the kind of Christian community that both treats marriage with the utmost respect and honors it as a lifelong commitment, but also reaches out to protect those who've been hurt, who've been mistreated, and to those who are vulnerable now. Fourth and finally, either marriage or singleness can, can both be amazing tools in the hand of a sovereign God to conform us to his own image, if only we will see it that way and allow him to use it. We ought to bloom where we are planted, knowing that God is using our context, even if you're escaping refugee, even if you are uh, broken from a previous marriage, God is using your context as a tool to conform you to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you that your word instructs us in these very practical day-to-day -day matters. God, we know that it's, it's not easy, either one, to live as a single when 
especially when life hasn't gone as you thought it would go. It's not easy to be married and to give yourself away to someone else and to die to yourself and put their needs ahead of your own. And yet, God, I pray that you would both enable singles to pursue whatever life you've called them to with joy, with gratitude, and with holiness. And that you would enable our married couples to, to strengthen their bond, not only with each other, but more importantly with you, in a way that, that, that structures their family life in the way that you would have it to go, and that their models for their children what a sacred union not only a husband and wife have with one another, but that union is a reflection of the union that you have with us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen marriages in our church. I pray that you would use uh, the, the resources that we have to, to strengthen that bond. God, I thank you for the, those who've walked the, the journey of faithfulness, and I pray for those who've endured divorce and who have been uh, broken uh, through a series of of uh, sinful uh, issues in, in their lives and in the lives of their spouse. God, we pray that you would heal them, that you would heal those wounds that only you can restore, that you would help us to wrap our arms around them in loving ways that, that validate their experience and also help them to, to heal and move forward in the healthy way that you would have them to go. Lord, we need your help. We need your grace. None of us can do this on our own. So we do ask, as the choir sang so beautifully just a few moments ago, that your Holy Spirit would come and fill us and that we would be emptied of sin and pride and all the things that, that cause us to struggle against the healthy, flourishing life that you have for us in this season where we are now. We pray this in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen, we're gonna sing a song of surrender as part of our invitation now. We're gonna sing, wherever he leads, I'll go. That's a bold thing to say, especially if it means going overseas, especially if it means entering into a relationship or maybe exiting a relationship. I don't know where the Lord is leading you, but to, to sing honestly from your heart, wherever he leads, I'll go, is a prayer of submission and deference to the one who is sovereign because he knows what is best for you and for me and for our church and for our nation. So I pray you can sing this from your heart to his heart. If you've never received Christ, as Jim said earlier, maybe today's the day. Maybe you're ready to go from death to life and receive the grace that is ours in Jesus Christ, the free gift of salvation for the very first time. If you're ready to receive that gift today, I'd love to talk with you about that right now. Maybe you're ready to join Woodmont Baptist Church. You say, I'm in. I wanna be a part of what God's doing here. I, I, I wanna be a member where we commit our time, our talent, our treasure to this church and be a part of what the Lord is doing at Woodmont. Maybe you've never been baptized and you wanna experience that act of obedience where you are outwardly showing what's happened to you inwardly, that you've gone from death to life. If, if you wanna do that too, I'll be down here. Maybe you just wanna come pray because Life is hard, marriage is hard, singleness is hard, okay? But Jesus has overcome the world. All the tribulation we have, Jesus has overcome it. Hear that good news today. Let's stand and sing, wherever he leads, I'll go.
I pray that's true for you and me. Will you be seated real quickly? We've got some business to conduct. Bobby, can they finish filling those out later? Is that okay with you? Ken and Ardeth, come stand up here. Uh, she said no. Yeah, she means it. Uh, <laughs> did you know that Dewey Dunn was the best man at Ken and Ardeth's wedding, which was 10 years ago, five years ago? Is that, oh, something like that. Okay, something like that. But uh, Ken... Well, did you really? You made the what? Bobby made the wedding cake at their wedding. That's amazing. And to see it come full circle. And this is what a small world it is and how God is sovereign and everything. Ken and Ardeth taught me as a child at Oak Valley Baptist Church in Franklin, where Jim Gallery was pastor. Jim was the young adult pastor here at Woodmont during Dr. Sherman's uh, pastorate. And now they are coming back home. And now the kid that they taught, I get to teach them as their pastor. It's such a neat thing to see. Their daughter, Anne, and Jim's daughter, Julie, the three of us were like the only kids in the church. So we were spoiled and everybody loved us and uh, poured into us. And we were really raised together. And uh, my parents helped raise Anne and they helped raise me. It's just so neat to see a family of faith uh, operating the way that God intended for it to operate. So uh, I'm super thrilled and honored to have Ken and Artith. Ken, already, you've seen him in the choir, and uh, artists already jumping in in so many ways. They are sweet, uh, gifted people who love the Lord and who are wonderful church people. Do you know what I mean by that? They just love the church, and they love Jesus, and they will be wonderful members. If you're a member of Woodmont Baptist Church, this is a business decision. Uh, if you will trust my recommendation that they are incredible, godly people, and you accept them into membership at Woodmont Baptist Church, will you voice your affirmation by saying, Amen. Amen. Any opposed? I never asked that. Okay, good. All right, welcome to our church. <laughs> I figured we wouldn't get any. Craig and Donna Witt, you uh, come on up here. Craig and Donna, y'all live in Portland, is that right? Ridgetop. Okay, I knew it was up there somewhere. Craig and Donna have been coming here for about a year now, I guess, nine months or so, since their daughter Isabella started at Lipscomb. Uh, she's studying, what's she studying? Fashion merchandising. Love it. Okay. They visited here with her on like orientation weekend or something, and they've just been coming ever since and have really jumped in here. And I told them when they came forward today, yesterday at Eddie Fest, I was leaving. I had the dog, and I had Isaiah and Jude, and it was hot, and so we were getting out of there, going home, and I, I looked back, and they were cleaning up, and Craig and Donna stayed, and were putting chairs away in the shed, and I was thinking, they get it. These are givers. They are pouring out into others. Yeah, isn't that cool? <laughs> Eddie's clapping. <laughs> you saved Eddie some work, uh, but what I love about Craig, too, is that he can dish it, and he can take it, too, so... Uh, Greg will give me some pointers on the way out sometimes, which I love. So uh, he's going to be a good fit, and so will Donna here at Woodmont. And your precious mom lives with y'all, is that right? Yeah, a sweet lady who comes time to time uh, with them as well. What's her name? Joyce. Joyce as well. Yeah, so when you see Joyce, be sure and tell her hello as well. But uh, we are excited to receive you guys. What church are you coming from? Is it a church up in Ridgetop? Lexington, Kentucky. Excellent. All the way from Lexington. Go Big Blue. Ryan Snellen's here and uh, some others. All right. If you affirm, I know Ryan will, if you affirm the wits coming as members of Woodmont Baptist Church, will you voice your support by saying amen? Amen. amen. Any opposed? Excellent. All right. Welcome to Craig and Donna. I just felt like that makes it more legit, right? <laughs> you're, you're really in. I invite y'all to come and meet them. Shake a hand if you're wanting, or an elbow if you want, or whatever. I'm sure they're willing to accommodate whatever your comfort level is with COVID protocols. Bobby D. Yes. Yeah, well, the Hicksons can maybe come stand up here. Y'all are in Family Matters class, right? And then uh, where y'all been attending? Have maybe a choir member. Can we get uh, a choir member? Sandy, come up here and stand with, with these sweet people. Uh, Sandy Morabito, former deacon chair. Uh, they've really uh, already plugged in. Wednesday nights, they're here every Wednesday night, Sunday morning too, just amazing to have them. Driving up from Franklin, right? And driving from Ridgetop. How long does it take you to get here? 30 minutes, wow. Well, welcome, we are thrilled to have you. Uh, will you please stand and receive a word of benediction? Thank you for being here today, it's been a good day. We gotta get to Bobby's house for lunch. and Then uh, Hillsboro Baccalaureate is uh, gonna be here at two o'clock today, which they used to do that back in the day, didn't they, Hillsboro's Baccalaureate? And, they're coming back today, so uh, pray for that special service for the name of Jesus to be lifted high among the Hillsborough family as they come today. Let's receive a word from the Lord. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body 
be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Go in peace. This has been the live broadcast of Woodmont Baptist Church. If you would like to know more about the people and programs at Woodmont, or if you would like to stream both live and pre-recorded services, go to woodmontbaptist.com or call us at 615-297-5303. This program is funded by the members and supporters of Woodmont Baptist Church and is produced by Woodmont Baptist Television. Thanks for watching.